good. Very good. Memorial service for Deaconess's mother is this Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock up at Trinity Lutheran Church in Reading. This Thursday, we have um, our, our, our combination of two fun things that we get to mush together. Uh, we've been doing some table some uh, table talk on on uh, Thursday evenings, typically, and this is uh, this is where we usually get together at Jersey's Haircut and Brews and pick a topic and and talk about it over Lutheran libation. This time we are going to have uh, one of our town hall meetings, and we're going to kind of combine that with our table talk. So what that means is, is that we will have, on a Thursday night here at church, um, we'll probably meet in the fellowship hall. That's kind of my uh, thought at this point. I think that that'll work all right well. Um, and uh, we will have some Lutheran libations available. If you would like to bring something, either a Lutheran libation or otherwise, um, you are most welcome to do so. But regardless, uh, what we're talking about is, uh, is kind of some of our ongoing discussions about our properties and what are the decisions we need to make on our property. Walt has a handout which he gave out after first service. If you missed it after first service, he'll give you one now. You're still going to second service, and you got to wait. Because yeah. that's how it works. Or if you're not going, you're only going to Sunday school. Or if you're school, only going to Sunday school, wait, then we got to talk. Then you'll raise your hand. <laughs> maybe you can have one then. Um, but we'll talk about that. Heating, air conditioning, air conditioning, flooring, lighting, solar. And I wanted to, uh, Walt, can you get the light for me real quick? Um, one of the things, one of the things that we that we kind of continue to play with here is our is our space, and I'm not going to do a discussion about this because you got to come Thursday, but I am going to explain it briefly. This is our sanctuary, okay, and this is this is where the wall is right now. There are walls there and there. We have been kind of trying to wrestle with ways of eking out a little bit more space in our sanctuary and um, and apparently people don't like to be stacked so we have to go out somehow um, this is one of the possibilities and we'll and we'll uh, we'll knock this around a little bit on Thursday as well what this does is move this wall which is where the divider is over about eight feet, something like that, put a permanent door in here, and then have the divider go across. This is the hallway along the way, and then open up that wall. So this is kind of, this would work as kind of overflow seating along the way. And then remove these two closets so that basically the entire fellowship hall moves over about eight feet. And adding in an entryway right here and an entryway right here. That entryway is there now, but this would be a bigger bigger entryway. And then move the kitchen over also about eight feet. So the kitchen, I think, would actually end up being a little bit bigger. This would be where the opening would be for the kitchen, where that window would be. And then this is where the library is. The library would be a little bit smaller, but still would be a usable space then this would be a larger meeting room. We could put one of the dividers up if we wanted to have a, an actual divider in place as well. This is uh, something, it's an idea, and we want to kind of knock it around, see if this is worth pursuing. Um, what what would be the ultimate gain for this? Is this worth the, uh, it, is this worth the, the dollars that it would take and all of that kind of stuff? No decisions have remotely been made. This is a conversation. And the way that Christians figure things out, mm -hmm. this is really cool, is by talking to each other. <laughs> and and kind, of, uh, kind of working through those things. So this, is, so this is something that we're looking at. We'll talk about this on, sun, on uh, Thursday night at 7. Have I uh, forgotten anything, Walt? Is there anything to add to all of this portion? Nope. Well, you know, we'll kind of cover subject by subject and then just open it up for conversation. This is all about 
talking about the stuff. Nothing will proceed until we uh, beat it to death. Well, until we figured it out, and we figured out um, how, how things would be paid for. Yes. You know, that's always a part of such conversations. <laughs> all right. Is, I'm sorry, is there an estimate on what that would cost to move all this stuff? Maybe? You better come Thursday. I'm not telling you. <laughs> 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 you gotta come Thursday. I just got this uh, nailed down on uh, this morning. Um, pastor Espinosa is a, is a uh, pastor in Irvine uh, and the author of a delightful book that CPH published last year called Faith That Seeds to the Culture. And he is going to uh, lead a, uh, a, a retreat slash seminar for us on Saturday, January 25th. Uh, I, will, I will get kind of the exact times and all that kind of good stuff. But he's going to be with us this weekend, that weekend. So he's going to do the seminar on Saturday, and then he will preach in the Bible class on Sunday morning. Um, Pastor Espinoza is a delightful, uh, uh, delightful gentleman. Um, I know that uh, a number of our of our youth went to his sectional uh, with uh, when we were down in Irvine for the Higher Things Conference. So I'm uh, very excited to get this kind of lined up. But I wanted to get that date out for you while the date was in front of me. Um, then, if you hit the light for me, just hit the top one. Well, thank you. Um, and then, uh, uh, just a couple other other pieces. Well, August 29th. Oh, yes. August 29th. <coughs> um, as you all remember, you approved paving. Yes. August 29th is a date for the paving. Now, we're going to be operating a school that day, and we're also going to have, like, rollers and and loaders and paving equipment and big trucks here and also 110 kids so we need your help we need to guide these kids through the maze of the paving but you can't get to school without crossing the parking lot the parking lot's going to be dead there's also going to be trucks full of asphalt and junk like that out, out front so we're going to set up a parking area and then we don't know exactly because the paving company won't tell us exactly what they're doing, but we're going to have to guide these kids in, especially from like 7.30 to 8.30 where him, yeah, there's lots of <coughs> cars that come up and there's like families that might have two or three kids with them. We're going to have to escort them past the big equipment and I feature that we might want to have some you know, guards, crossing guards, sort of crossing thing. guards, kind of like all along our path, which whatever we set up. So I'm thinking we need 10 or 12 people here for the morning, for sure. And then kids come and go all day long. So um, we just need people here to help guide them through. Um, we might be going through the church, or we might be going through the through the through the grassy area out here. Um, but we got to get the kids in, in and out of the school, which is going to be uh, an issue. So we want, you know, s supreme safety. Gotcha. So we'll put up tape, we'll what put up cone. Thursday. 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 Thursday, August 29th. So I need about 10, 12 people. So Will it see just me. be one day? Yeah, one day. Yeah, they're going to pay for one day. So, okay? Think about it. All right, and talk to Walt if you can help. All right, second, uh, I, I think maybe, maybe last, uh, I just want to uh, introduce Pastor Bell. Very nice to have you here. This is Brian's father and his wife, Julie, and wonderful to have you both here. Pastor Pastor Bell is here for Levi's baptism down there. So, so uh, one, of the, one of the great perks of being a pastor is being able to uh, baptize your own grandchildren. So. God be with you. And that's something that you gave the privilege to do. And it is my honor, and I pray someday someone else will turn the favor to me. So that's what I'm saying for. But not anytime soon. <laughs> All right. Are there any other announcements? Yeah. All right. Let's get to our uh, our topic at hand then. We are talking about. Uh, baptism part two. I gotta check the question bucket first. See if anybody's throwing any curveballs at me today. Oh, good. 
The ELCA church body declares that it is a sanctuary church. What is the position taken by the LCMS church? Well, oh, that shouldn't take too long. <laughs> the, the, the short version the short version of that is that the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate does not um, does not have have any kind of particular stance on on that specific issue. Um, what I what I will say so, so that's the answer to that exact question. What I will say, stepping back from that question slightly, is that um, we as Christians live very firmly in with our feet in two kingdoms: the kingdom of the left, or the kingdom of power, and the kingdom of the right, the kingdom of grace. And at, in the kingdom of the left, we live and follow the laws of the land. This is kind of fourth commandment, Romans 13, and the like. And so uh, it is our responsibility as citizens to follow and uphold the laws of the land. What, unless those laws are actually unjust and caught, force us or compel us to sin. So, for example, abortion would be a, a, uh, an obvious example of a law that we would say is unjust and wrong. Um, so that's kind of kingdom of the left. On the right, on the kingdom of the right, it is our, uh, our responsibility and duty as Christians to love our neighbor. And in fact, there is lots of material and places in the scriptures that speak very specifically about the need and obligation for Christians to love the sojourner and foreigner among you. And, and you cannot read the Bible and avoid that. You just cannot. And so, so we are very much in, in this kind of what I would call two kingdom place where we, we keep and uphold and recognize the laws of the land. And we also keep and recognize uh, what I will call the law of mercy and the need to show mercy and compassion uh, to those who are in need. How those two things interact is very complicated sometimes. But those, but we always, as Christians, have to keep, have to keep those, those two poles in tension. Because if we if we sort of fall on one, we become we become legalists, and, um, and where love is grown cold, and we no longer know how to show mercy and compassion to those people. If we simply if we simply say laws don't matter, then we become something like anarchists, and and we're actually creating chaos and and courting a complete disaster. And so those two have to be held in tension. You can't cannot have a conversation about one without talking about the other. So that's that's my uh, that's my two minute answer to that question. I have thought actually about doing a Bible study on that um, on simply the whole topic of immigration. Um, there's a, a very good study that our church body did not too long ago uh, that was published. And if people are interested in that, I'm very happy. Let's mention that an answer. Anybody pulling out the tar feathers? Okay. All right. Let's talk about baptism. <clears throat> what benefits does baptism give? Say it with me. It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God <coughs> declare. Which are the Or a, or not even a rehearsal, the real thing 
uh, for a baptism in about 45 minutes, which is a, an excellent object lesson. Well done, guys. That was well done. Thank you. Um, so, so, so that's what baptism is. Remember the word, what does the word baptize mean? Remember? It means wash. Yeah, it means wash. And the, and the presumption in the ancient world would, would have been wash means wash with the water. And I think you could argue pretty compellingly that if you were washing with water in the ancient world, that also meant that you were probably going to use some kind of oil to seal the water in because this is an exceedingly arid, uh, arid area of the world. Um, but the word simply means to wash. So this gets at what does it do? And in order to answer that question, let's, let's just kind of think about this word benefit. When I think about benefits, what am I what am I thinking about if I say I'm talking about benefits today? What am I getting out of it? What am I getting out of it? Yeah. And usually we're thinking in terms of health insurance or uh, perks at work, retirement, these kind of things. You have a benefits plan something like that. The word, um, the word comes from, uh, from the Latin word bene, which means good. So it's literally, what good does it do me? That's the, that's the question. What good does baptism do? And, that's the, and that, I think, is really the key, the key question here. Uh, Luther gives us three answers. Uh, and, and in my mind, you always got to look at now, what are the what are the verbs? It works, forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation. To all who believe this, the words and promises of God declare. Now, this is where I think it gets it, it gets interesting because if I were to ask you. Who or what saves you? There are a bunch of ways you can answer that. Being Christians, I would hope that your first answer would be something like the Sunday school answer, right? Jesus. Jesus saves. Um, but you can also say, as um, Peter does, baptism saves. Well, is it Jesus or is it baptism? Yes. 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 Exactly. And and so we might say that Jesus is the content of our salvation, and that baptism is the is the mean for the instrument of our salvation. And so, just like asking the question, when were you saved? How do you answer that question? When were you saved? <laughs> On the cross, yep, that'd be one answer. When I was baptized. When I was baptized, that'd be another good answer. <laughs> yeah, when God, when when God made me or created me, I think you can even say um, that God. And, you know, we get this numerous places in the scriptures that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We get that in Ephesians, for instance. Uh, we could also say that I'm not finally saved until the last day, when kind of everything comes together. Could you and, say I don't know? No, I don't think I'd say I don't know, because um, because all of those answers are true, and it's and it's important to recognize that when we use a word like saved. That might mean different things for different people. Uh, so for some, asking the question, when were you saved, refers to a very specific decision that I had made. I decided that I was going to be, that I was going to follow Jesus, that I was going to be saved on this day at this time. And some people, if you were, as adults, you might you might be able to say. Uh, this is this is when I first became aware that I trusted in Christ for my salvation. For others, they might not. I, it's unlikely in in uh, five years Levi is going to remember today. The 
doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't mean it wasn't significant. <laughs> but, um, but that is, but nevertheless, his own memory of that may be a little bit, a little bit different. So, kind of getting at what baptism does or continues to do is, I believe, a tremendously <coughs> important question for us as Christians to sort of recognize what does God, what does God teach? Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So, so we get with Peter, baptism now saves you. We get with Paul, faith saves you. And we get Christ saves you. And here we get whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Notice the future tense there? <laughs> will be saved. Um, baptism creates faith. Baptism also uh, recognizes and confesses the faith that is that is there. Kind of a bold fan. Do you remember last week when we talked about um, when we talked about what baptism is? We looked at that Matthew twenty-eight a little bit. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That baptism and teaching and faith through the Word of God are completely inseparable. That that baptism cannot be simply a rabbit's foot. You know what I mean by that? Um, baptism isn't just a uh, get out of hell free card, you know. Like, does anybody play Monopoly anymore? Yes. Oh, you guys know Monopoly. Yeah. Um, but uh, baptism is not simply a, uh, a a rabbit's foot or a get out of hell free card. It creates faith. Faith is sustained and upheld by the Word of God, um, and that's where this belief. Comes in. So if we make baptism something separate from faith, that's when we're turning it into magic. That's when we're turning it into some kind of something apart from what God promises and delivers. And that's a, boy, is that an important understanding for us that this is about faith and trust in Christ through the Word of God. And that just as God does this work through His Word, does this work through the visible <coughs> word and work in holy baptism. Now, I've had several hands which I've studiously ignored. <laughs> Larry, Heather, Mary. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you went for it because I was going to have to go back one slide on the other. Is the belief, uh, the belief issue. Okay. You believe, you're saved. You're uh, you don't believe, you're not saved regardless of baptism. Okay. Uh, at one part of the Bible it says you'll be saved if you have the faith of a, a mustard seed, and then another part it says I will spew you out if you're lukewarm in your faith. Okay. Yep. Uh, huh? Huh? <laughs> you know, What's the question, Larry? <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Faith is always uh, faith is and is always a gift. Um, faith is a gift that is given by God through his word. It is described in different ways at different times in the scripture. And faith too, how would I, uh, faith, faith and the confession of faith and what that confession is can vary at different times and in different, and in different ways. So the way that a child confesses confesses the faith is different than the way that an adult confesses the faith. You know, I, I might call it something like faith, faith moving to understanding. I don't know about you, but for me, I feel like I am continually a student of God's word and that my level of, under, my level of understanding kind of ebbs and flows and that I'm, I feel like I've got something figured out and then the next day, I'll turn around. I don't think I've gotten anything. And I wonder why 
by standing up here in front of you. Um, but God's word is what creates and sustains faith along the way. It's not, it's not anything else. Any kind, and, and kind of my, my rule of thumb, too, when it comes to faith, and it's interesting how much faith has to do with baptism. This is very intentional on Luther's part. We're kind of doing exactly what, what I would argue that Luther is intending to go through with baptism, that faith has to have an object. It's always, it's always faith in Christ. It's never faith sort of by itself. Faith is not a faith is not a thing apart from Jesus. It's faith in Christ. That's the gift, is that my my focus, my direction, what is is toward Christ. Because he is the he is the one that gives faith. He is the source of my faith. And so if faith turns, if I have a faith apart from Jesus, then what am I, what am I faithing? <laughs> what am I trusting? Myself? Nobody? Something. I mean, it's God always has to be connected to Jesus. And that's why in holy baptism, God's name is put on the child. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or kind of the very first thing that we'll see is, receive the Holy Cross, both on your forehead and upon your heart, to mark you as one redeemed by Christ and crucified. That God's name is put on this child. That's the object of that child's faith, just as it is the object of your faith. And faith is not simply a matter of, of knowledge or intellectual assent or a feeling. You know, if I feel a certain way, then I've got it all figured out. I'm really in trouble if that's the case. Um, nor is it a matter of doing the right things. Faith is always a gift that comes from God. And that object of Christ is always the sort of the trajectory. And I, and, I, and I realize that doesn't answer all of these questions very but, but these are kind of the big, the big things for us to continually come back to when we talk about what does it mean to be a Christian and where does baptism fit, is the Word of God delivering, creating, sustaining what God promises in that same word. Heather. Once saved, always saved. Um, that is a uh, an expression that you will that you will hear sometimes, um, and and it too is a bit of a uh, is a bit of a paradox because uh, if I if I use that phrase, it makes it it, it kind of makes it sound like what that actually means is that there's faith doesn't have any part in anything. So, so I could actually become a complete reprobate unbeliever, and because I was once saved, now faith has no part of it. Um, faith in the scriptures is always a, a a living, active thing. It's no accident that the that that Paul and the scriptures continually use living examples. You are the body of Christ. Um, that and that a body has to be fed and nurtured and sustained in order to be kept alive. And so, um, and so faith that is not fed and nurtured and sustained will die. Because it's not being fed. That's what the Word of God does. The Word of God is what sustains faith. Um, but as long as I'm looking at the faith and I'm not looking at Christ, I'm kind of missing the, I'm missing the point there. Um, and and so uh, so for instance, if somebody says to me, "I'm not sure if I believe anymore," and I've had that happen on many occasions, in fact, um, how do you how do you answer that question? I'm not I'm not sure I believe anymore. How would you how would you answer that? Where would you point that? Let me point that. Point them to the baptism. Point them to to Jesus. Point them to the promises that God has made. It could be, and and often is, that 
the reason that they're having these questions is because of doubt, of course, in their own minds and hearts. In the, and, and guess what? The more that you're looking inside yourself, the more doubt you're going to find. The more uncertainty you're going to find. And the more fear and heartache you're going to find. And so the, the, my sort of pastoral goal in, a, in that <coughs> instance is going to be to get them off of themselves and onto Jesus. Because that's where the certainty lies, is in God's promises, not in, you know, kind of the spiritual workout of my faith. Because we kind of live in a culture where faith, I think, is equated with willpower. This is why I think that for most Americans, Christianity is basically spiritual weight watchers. You know, what, you know what I mean by that? If you kind of, if you get into the right habits, if you do the right things, if you count out the right, the right things, and you get the right points, then you're going to be good, and then you're going to be a Christian. Everything's going to be good. Well, that's that's not Christianity. That's that's a self-help program. And while it may be good for losing weight, that's not how you're saved. <laughs> that's not the same thing. And, and so that's why this notion of faith as gift and the role that baptism plays is so incredibly important for us, especially as we continue to be burdened and troubled by our sin. Was there another thing Mary? Did I get um, to already? I don't remember. Yeah. Um, and then Jill. So because we baptize our infants, and Levi doesn't even know it's Sunday, um, it, it, really, it really becomes the responsibility of the parents to be responsible for this sacrament until that child is old enough to understand. Yeah, and, and the way that I would the way that I would try to approach that, or the way that I, I, I approach that is as as parents we are we are responsible for our children in all things. You know, feeding Sleeping, pooping, eating, all of it, and um, and I do all of these things on behalf of and for for my child. I'm not going to say to my to my child, "Well, do you do you um, have you decided to eat today?" Um, no, I think I could probably get an idea, <laughs> but um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put it that way because because I know what's best. For I know what they need, and just as as a child needs the the physical nourishment that that can only come from a mother and a father, I will add. In in the same way, they they need the nourishment that can only come from their heavenly Father, and so so I as a as a Christian father, I'm going to bring my child to where God has made those promises. But and, and this too, I think, is one of the one of the great mm, challenges that we have in American Christianity is that American Christianity is extremely highly individualistic. That you know, this is my faith, my salvation, my decision, my doing, and everything in the scriptures tells you it's a community package deal. That we, that you are the body of Christ. It's it's not that you are a personal warrior for Jesus. That's just not there. And and so when you're baptized, you're baptized into Christ. You're baptized into a community, into a body of believers. So that so that it's not simply you. It's never just you. But that God has actually put this this family in this place to care for you and nurture you and bring you and bring you forward. Sometimes that family also happens to be family by blood. But um, the blood of Christ is our true blood, <laughs> not simply the blood of our family. Well, I've been listening to the epistles in the last couple of weeks. And, uh, yeah, the epistle. And it talks about faith of all these guys. Um, you know, I and, but yes. and 
but always the result of their faith was growing the body of Christ, mm -hmm. or the the children of Israel. You know, right? It was they always, do they do know, these things for the sake of for the sake of the whole. Right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Absolutely. So that's so that's an interesting part in in baptism is that baptism uh, is done to an individual. But it is done with a community and for uh, for the whole. Yes. In the baptism rites, there is a place where the congregation says yeah. that they will love and support this child yeah. through their baptism. Yeah, absolutely, it is it is very much a package deal. And this, this is why, you may recall from, from last week, um, this is why I'm, I'm always um, nervous and frustrated when I, when I have the, you know, my grandchildren are only going to be in town for 24 hours, will you baptize them, please? Because they're being robbed of the community in that instance. Um, oftentimes, I will do it. I will do it. But recognizing that they're that they are being severely handicapped in that process, and in and in fact, there are many pastors that won't, and I can't blame them for that either, because this is all all a part of that a part of that whole, and so it um, so it's very it, it's just a, a tremendous challenge when uh, when you have someone that comes to be baptized that doesn't have a tie to the community or barely has a tie to the community. And and of course we recognize that God can can and does all things through his son. So you know we're I am not trying to second guess the promises of God. I also recognize what is the normal process by which God does works and does these things. And these things are normal because they are what is best. So, so there's the challenge. Larry. I always have a concern, and it might just be me assuming that people are like me. I wish I could have the faith of a child, but I don't. It is, I have to continually have to study. And going to church and hearing, you know, the, the few little passages that are separated out of the content is not enough. It's like I've spent most of the week reading about basically ancient Jewish Married marital rights, which makes things a lot clearer because you know we're based ours on basically right. Rome, right. and what when and somehow I get the feeling that when we do confirmation, people think it's at an end, right? If, and if, if you want to stay into it, for me, I can't do it. I fall away if I don't study what's going on, what's the pol politics going on. And what's the lay of the land? And I would and I would add to that that this is why it's also why it's so important to kind of keep the keep, keep these these simple truths that we get from the catechism kind of front and center that we not allow ourselves to get sort of sidetracked. And you guys know how much I love going down rabbit trails, um, but not allowing the rabbit trail to become the highway. Probably an analogy that'll break down at some point. <laughs> um, but but we've got to keep this the central reality of who God is in Christ, what He gives to us in His Son, how He delivers these things. That that's always got to be kind of front and center, and we got to keep coming back to that over and over and over again because we will forget. We will we will lose it along the way. Um, one one last thing on this. Or no, have my watch on, so I don't know what time it is, but I'm kind of five hours. Oh, we got all the time in the world. Um, <laughs> so whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be, will be condemned. Uh, there's a, a piece to this that's also very important, and that is that baptism is, is bound to faith. We got that part, I hope, pretty clear at this point. Um, but also that unbelief is what condemns. Um, not 
lack of baptism. Okay? Why does that matter? It's huge. Well, it's, it's huge. And the reason our, my, our daughter-in-law is a believer. She's never been baptized. Mm -hmm. And thus, our three children have never been baptized. Right. So this is all very personal. Oh, you. gosh, yes. Uh, and I understand. And my guess is that, that, my guess is, is that nearly everybody in this room could, could tell a variant of that story. And, and so, <clears throat> baptism is the, is the normal, regular means by which God does these things. Um, God works through his word. And his word will do what it says and promises. So, um, so I don't have to. I don't have to, to stress about whether or not God is going to work through His word. He <laughs> does. That's that's what He says. That's what He promises. Um, but it is unbelief that condemns, not a lack of baptism. Baptism is not some in some sort of divine uh, check mark. Says okay, uh, you know, you you uh, you you came to faith, and you were and you know one you were baptized two so then you're in. Well, you didn't get baptized even though you were saved. Well, sorry, deep on the cross, you're up. No, um, there's a difference between between not being baptized and despising baptism. And um, and and a lot of times, at least in my in my experience. This kind of comes down more to uh, more to ignorance than act, active dis despisal. But if someone says, "Well, I believe, but I refuse to be baptized because I don't believe that baptism does anything," well, then it then it becomes a little bit less clear on what are they saying that they believe because of what God promises in baptism. And uh, and I realize that that's a uh, that, 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 that may easily be very difficult for me too, but obviously other church bodies are going to have a different perspective on baptism, and while, while we believe that what we teach is according to the scriptures, um, I don't have to be the one that finds what God's word says. Let's, let's say above my pay grade. Okay. Heather. Have we used the word sacrament? Like that baptism is a sacrament or a means of grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I talked about that a little bit a little bit last week. That this that the term the term sacrament. I mean, it it, it literally means a, a holy a holy act or something set apart. And and so really, I would say that the word of God is the. Uh, I'll back up. Lutherans, when we when we say sacrament or the sacraments, we're usually referring to baptism and the Lord's Supper, and um, uh, and sometimes uh, we'll include confession and absolution. Uh, I would I would argue that really the the main sacrament is the Word of God. That to be sacramental means to have the Word of God. And the promises that are tied to the Word of God at the center of what we seem to do, and that that's the, uh, if you will, the active ingredient in baptism and the Lord's Supper is the Word of God, and that that's what it means to be sacramental. Um, so, so yeah, we would call we would call baptism a sacrament or a part of the a part of God's deliverance. And it instills grace. It and it, right, and it, remember what this you know it works forgiveness of sin, rescues from death and the devil, gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare that this is what baptism does and delivers because it is tied to the word and the promises of God. And that's what God's word promises. That's what baptism delivers. Well, works. It works. What? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting word there, isn't it? Yeah, that, that. It, it, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I, I think the reason that the word works is in there is to contrast it to um, to our works. That baptism is the is it does these things. I would. I, I've never done a word study of that in in this context, but that's my 
that's my pious guess yeah. on what's going on there. Then, so it's almost like the word activate. So yeah, yeah activate, activate, right. Activate I mean, it, it forgiveness does. does. <laughs> you know, and, then, and you get works, rescues, which is a, a little more vivid delivery language, and gives. So in all of these cases, these are these are very active words that describe what God is doing through baptism. And that baptism is not a passive thing, but that it is active in doing these things. Not just once, all the time. Right, right. And, and notice too, thank you, that this is present tense. It's not, it worked. <laughs> so, you know, we would, we would say, I mean, I, I could say I was baptized on May 6, 1971, but really, um, I am baptized, that that is a continual state of being. That is my identity as a Christian, is that I am baptized along the way. Any questions or thoughts at this point? I see lots of, lots of wheels turning in people's heads, which is good. Yeah. Um, that's the trouble with our English language is that so many words have multiple meanings. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so when we think of works, we think of something physically working. Right, so right. Yeah, and and, that, and in some respects, that's the, that's the difficulty with any language. But in this instance, I would say that, that that is a good use of that term because baptism continues to work. That is, it continues to do things, to, to be active. And, and more, this is why why Luther will point you to your baptism and say, how do how do I know that God loves me? I am baptized. Now, is that the only way that I can answer that question? No, of course. There are lots of ways I can answer that question. But baptism is an objective fact. It is an action that happened at, at a point in time that has continual enduring consequences. Um, if I say I was married on July 1st, 1995, that implies, but I'm not anymore. So I don't say I was married. <laughs> I would say I am married, and we were married on such and such a date, because that continues to this point. It's a continual thing. Well, um, that hymn, I am um, baptized in Christ, right. the first yeah. two lines, I think is a really good way of remembering your baptism, you know. Um, you know, Luther says make the cross, sign the cross, and right. say, but that's one way for me to translate that into something a little Right, simpler. God's own child, I gladly say it, I am baptized in Christ. And he, yeah. he, because I could not pay, pay the full redemption price. Yep, good stuff. So next week, we will get at, if you guys will let me, uh, how can water do such great things? Because that is also, the, I think, the underlying question is, and we sort of talked about this a little bit when we talked about the water, plain water versus holy water stuff from last week. But this will, but this will try to get at that more, and I hope we'll clarify even further where the Word of God fits in this whole picture. Much to think about, my friends, but a very good class. That much close to spending. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.